When you hear the phrase flying cow, what would you think about? For me, it would be Gugalana, also known as the Bull of Heaven from the Epic of Gilgamesh. That mythology is what the constellation Taurus is based on, by the way. Well, enough of that. For some zoologists, especially ornithologists, it would be this bird. It's called Hotsin. But why would this bird be called the flying cow? Well, let me brought up the broader question. What exactly is Hotsin? The Hotsin is a bird in the order Opistocomiformes. This order only has one family, the Opistocomidae. There is only one extant genus in this family, which is the Opistocomus. And guess what? It's monotypic, meaning it only contains one species, Opistocomus hotsin, which is, yep, easily guessed, the hotsin. Oh, by the way, Opistocomus means behind hair, which refers to the long crest behind its head. Currently, hotsin can only be found around the Amazon and Orinoco Basin. One of the unique things about them is that their cheeks have two claws which make them look like a prehistoric bird, like Archaeopteryx and other that live alongside dinosaurs. They use this claw to help them climb trees. Another group of extant birds also shared this character, which are the Turacos. But the thing is, even if they look like a prehistoric bird, they are actually not a close relative to them, and probably not primitive at all. Oh, and Hotsins are also not that closely related to the Turacos. A publication in 2024, which had only been published two weeks ago by the way, at least by the time I made this video, had shown that Hotsin is closely related to aquatic birds, such as the flamingos and grebes. So yeah, sometimes phylogenetic are quite interesting. But they do swim from time to time I guess, mostly when they are attacked by predator on the trees though. So, this time it's not very surprising. The other unique things about them is their diets. When you see them, you might not guess that they are volivores, meaning they eat leaves. They do eat fruits sometimes, but 90% of their diets are leaves. And not only that, they can do foregut fermentation, just like ruminants, such as cow, which is why they are also known as the flying cow. Hotsin has an enlarged crop. In this enlarged crop, there are a lot of bacteria, around 1,700 species. These varieties of bacteria species might be caused by the diverse food the Hotsin eat. Just like other animals that do foregut fermentation, these bacteria break down plant polysaccharides and detoxify plant chemicals. This process can take a long time, depends on the size of consumed food up to 45 hours, which is about the same duration as in a large foregut fermenting animals, such as sheep. This fermentation causes bacterial vapors to be exhaled by them, which apparently smells really bad, which is why this bird is also called the sting bird. So this bird has two peculiar titles. Good for them, I guess. Or not. Oh, and because they have such a large crop, their sternum is compromised, and so, their wing muscles are also compromised, because several wing muscles insertions are on the sternum. Birds usually have a large sternum with a high carina, so they have a strong wing muscle. Compared to other birds, Hotsin's sternum and carina are underdeveloped. This makes them a bad flyer. Well, they do take their time to sit around and process their food, so being a bad flyer is not that big of a deal, I guess. Alright, so, there are actually other extinct genera in this family, and it reveals quite an interesting history. Fossils of Hotsin relatives had been found in several places. Namibia fish was found in Namibia, dating to early Miocene. Hotsina fish was found in Brazil, dating to Oligomyocene, while Protoazin was found in France, dating to late Eocene. Oh, just to clarify, here is the epoch division in the geologic timescale. So, let's think about this for a second. Why is this even a big deal? First of all, I told you, Hotsins are bad flyers. 
And the fossils found also indicates that these extinct genera were also bad flyers. And if you look at the world map, there is a large barrier between these places. The ocean. And I guarantee you, they can't just swim across the oceans. Well, even if they can, I don't think they will. And if you think, oh, surely they crossed when the land was connected. Well, yes, but it might not be as connected as you think. Because these lands have drifted apart even since Cretaceous. And yes, Cretaceous is the period where popular dinosaurs such as T-Rex and Triceratops roamed the Earth. It's from 145 million years ago, while the earliest Hodgson fossils was found dating back to only 35 million years ago at most. So, there are at least two things that we could take from this information. First, the Opistocomiformes was once more widespread. They might even be originated from the old world. And for whatever reason, they went extinct. The second is that the current lineage that become the Hodgson is relatively new. Somehow, someway, they migrated to South America, either from the population in Europe or the one in Africa. If they came from the population in Europe, they most likely traveled through the Northern Hemisphere. I believe to this day, there aren't any Opistocomiformes fossils found in North America, so we can't be sure about this. Either way, they most likely needed to travel through the sea. Whether it's a close gap such as the Northern Hemisphere pathway, or literally through the ocean from Africa to South America. Some of you might think this is outrageous, but it actually is not, because several evidence from different groups of animals also indicate similar occurrence. It's called rafting event, and you might already guess from the name, they basically raft their way across the sea. By that I mean, not that they deliberately make a raft, but more of an accident, such as when vegetations and logs are blown away to the sea by the storm. Those helpless creatures then just hold on to those accidental rafts, until they finally drift into an unknown land, like a castaway. And, I kid you not, these events had happened several times, mostly to small creatures such as rodents and reptiles. But it also happened to primates. And guess what? It was from Africa to South America, just like how the Hodgson might possibly end up in South America. While I did say it like it's no big deal, it's actually a big deal. These kinds of rafting event, especially from Africa to South America, is a big feat. One in a million maybe. So yeah, weird looking bird, with weird traits, in a weird place, by a weird circumstance. What a wonder to zoologists. There are still many more to be learned from them. But for now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now.